Um, okay, uh, I will get us started. Uh, so, so I just said this only like a minute ago, but I'll repeat it as people are coming on. Uh, two things. One is uh, think of questions. This panel will go better uh, with you asking questions. Um, there's a couple of places you can uh, you can either post them in the Zoom chat. You can post them on Slack and the RLAI channel. Uh, please do thread it with my posts so that it isn't uh, creating lots of pings for everybody else. Um, or uh, you know, if you raise your hand, uh, Zoom does have raise hand feature, right? Anyway, I don't even know. I'm not that familiar with Zoom either. Um, or unmute yourself to ask a question. Uh, we are going to try to give a little bit more focus this time to uh, ideas and scientific questions. Uh, since last panel, we gave a bit more focus to research methodology. So um, yeah, if you have questions in that vein, perfect. I'm going to, while people are generating questions, I am going to kick us off with a question for all of the panelists, um, which is what uh, research idea uh, or result um, that's that's been relatively recent, say, let's, let's say what recent research idea or result and it could be something really big, it could be really small, it could be your own, it could be someone else's, uh, but that has caused the most change in your current uh, thinking or research direction. And Martha's big on my screen right now, so I'm gonna ask Martha. Wow, <clears throat> biggest change is too strong of a word. So I'm just gonna mention two things that I feel like have changed, I've changed my thinking about a little bit this year. They are relatively small things, um, but I think they'll have long-term consequences for me. So one of them is that this year we started thinking more about how are we gonna get RL working on real systems. And the first sort of first natural thing was, well, we usually were gonna have offline logs of data. And so I think my mental thinking has now shifted to, for most settings, we're gonna have some data before we actually start learning online and we should start exploiting that data. So one of our recent projects is saying, how are we gonna pick hyperparameters before we deploy an agent, we have to specify all the hyperparameters ahead of time. And one way to try to do that is to use that offline log of data to pick those hyperparameters. Okay, and then another thing that I've been thinking about this year is uh, learning explicit policies is good, but policy gradient methods are a little bit of a mess. Uh, and I think there's a nice, a, a more general framework we can be thinking about of approximate policy iteration where we don't just have to limit ourselves to asking if I'm learning a parameterized policy, I should do gradient descent in a policy gradient objective. We can instead just be asking in the larger approximate policy iteration framework, how do I learn action values that tell me something about the quality of actions? And then how do I do some kind of gratification step to start increasing the probability of what my action values tell me are good actions? And then that iterative process is sort of the more general framework in which policy gradient methods actually lie. And maybe we have good algorithms in that larger space. Cool. Thanks, Martha. Rupam. Hi. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, some recent works, a uh, sequence of them um, that influenced my research, my group's research a lot. Uh, it started with the deep reinforcement learning that matters. It's not that recent, but still. One uh, result there, it, it shows that different implementations, they get different performance of the same algorithm. So how do we understand algorithms? Uh, do we reveal all the information about an algorithm in a paper? So that was uh, an issue that, uh, that I tried to adopt in my research seriously. And all these, I'm going to mention all four, they all have uh, big implications when we want to do learning uh, on real systems. So this is one, like it's a different implementation, but I have different problems, that's the problem. Another is, in my work, we showed something very similar, but with the same implementation and same randomization seed, if you have a, a slightly different uh, robotic setup, you're going to have different performance, widely different performance. That's yet another issue which I also adopted in my research, uh, started to address seriously. And then the other two, one is uh, the time limits in reinforcement learning. That paper kind of pointed out that the uh, environments that we are nowadays excited about, Mujoko uh, open gene tasks, deep mind control suite, many of them are probably not uh, giving us a proper optimization problem. They're not designed quite well. 
and that has an issue because if we ad adopt a similar way of designing tasks for a real robot, we will face like we face issues which we will not be able to debug in the real world. In simulation, we have the option of trying different things and finally find something that we have to do uh, uh, the simulation that looks good in the video. And the last one would be uh, that it, it's not definitely with uh, Philip Thomas showed it a long time ago, but it has been uh, 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 discussed again and again in the literature, but we are still not paying full attention, which is that uh, our modern false gradient methods, they are not quite uh, uh, having a, they're not, they do not have a proper objective. So that's the concern that what exactly they are doing. And I like that Martha mentioned that it's probably we need to look at the, maybe approximate false iteration would be a framework where we can understand them better. But still, yeah. Uh, that, that I think is, is important and, and we try to now uh, pay attention to that way more as a group. Cool, awesome. Thanks, Rupal. Rich. Okay, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, Mike, for setting us all up. Um, well, I'm going to give an answer that's sort of uh, the way my thoughts have been changing to become more the same, maybe, I, I think um, if it's sort of a call to arms, I'm sort of, sort of really uh, intrigued by the great success of, of neural networks, artificial neural networks. Um, but I also feel, I'm also a bit of a critic and really it's that, it's that I feel it, we've, research has become too narrow. We're, we're exploring, exploring a very small part of the space. It's called deep learning nowadays. And it's failing to explore lots of interesting parts. And so we should just recognize that there's enormous success. And so, you know, that doesn't mean we have to concentrate on exactly what's been successful in the past. That means we can recognize that success and try to broaden it. And so I want to make us, I want to encourage us to explore a different part of the space. I think we have to make a deliberate attempt to do something different because otherwise we get sucked into the same old thing. Okay, so we have to we have to uh, identify what's different and accept that we're going to get different kinds of success and maybe less success, but we're do a deliberate attempt to do something different. And so what I want to do, uh, what different thing? What do I propose as a different thing? Uh, well, I. I, it's a it's a simple perspective, and um, you can summarize. Sometimes I summarize it in the world naturalistic, naturalistic learning networks. But what I really mean is that they just respect the timing of experience and the uh, limits on computation that are that come from that timing. It all comes from timing, and and uh, what what it's going to be, I can say it in words that will make sense to you all right away. I think we have to commit to uh, learning online and learning in a strictly incremental way. We have to commit to learning from a single stream of experience. We have to commit to uh, not reusing any of the data, no replay buffers or anything like that. Uh, and and I have a couple more, but let me just say, as I list these things, that I think you can give very strong, good reasons for doing each one of these things. They're not just arbitrary constraints. Okay, uh, so the fourth thing is we commit ourselves to genuine approximation, to the idea that the data or the environment is much more complex than the agent. So he has to do genuine approximation, not find the exact right solution in the limit. And one way of saying many of these things is that we should have temporal symmetry. All times have to be the same. There are no special phases. And okay, with these, with these different constraints, oh, I have a name, I call it dynamic learning networks <laughs> or dynets. Um, uh, dynamic learning networks just means they are learning networks that, that continue to learn and they learn to learn better over time. So we could do this and we don't have to do it in the reinforcement thing setting. We could do, because this is either more basic switch we could do it supervised learning in a dynamic kind of way, or we could do prediction 
uh, but we should always have an idea towards reinforcement learning and state update. Yeah, different, I think it's time. It's like a call to honor. I think it's, that's what's changed. I've always felt that, I've always had a predilection for doing networks more like this, but what's changed is I think it's time. The success of deep learning has been large enough that we don't have to be, uh, we, we should be broadening it now. And um, you know, we, have, we have to take advantage of what we learned, but it's time to do something different deliberately. Cool, thanks, Rich. Um, Patrick. Cool, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I think it's actually quite amusing that I'm asked to comment on something recent that changed my thinking in that the paper I'm writing right now has a reference from 1543 where the publisher is listed as the Holy Roman Empire. So I'm maybe not the authority on, on things that are that are particularly recent. I, I like older literature. Um, but I'm gonna assume by recent, Mike, you mean- Patrick, I'll allow it to be recent for you. So if you want to cite the 1543 as as the recently changed your thinking, I'm good with that. Is that <laughs> well, I was going to say, I'm actually, I will accept the definition of recent, which is since AI was invented in 2012. Um, so, because uh, clearly that's when AI was invented, right? I, that's what I hear. Everyone says it these days. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, I think, Mike, you cut out a little bit. So hopefully I'm not cutting out for all of you. Um, uh, maybe Andy, I see Andy's face there. Am I cutting out? Can you still hear me? We good? No, it's, it's all good. Okay, awesome. Uh, so there's three sort of big pieces of new knowledge that have changed how I think about everything in the last in the last little while. Um, two of them I presented as tea time talks over the last couple of years, so I won't talk your ear off, but I'll just mention them. Uh, one is the the growing body of research on how humans and humans jointly act in their environment, how they make decisions and share decisions where they start to model each other and adapt those models in real time. It's called joint action is the field and how people actually extend their themselves out to incorporate other tools, including other living systems. That's been, that's been really huge for me. Um, another is a lot of recent developments by uh, talked about quite a bit by folks like Dean Buonamano and, and Eichenbaum and others and Patton on the way that the animal brain represents time, temporal processing, the delays between events, trace conditioning. So that's that's been hugely impactful on, on my work and, and the way I approach it. Um, the one I'd like to highlight today, though, is, is some of the work by uh, Tom Scott Phillips. So I've been reading uh, reading his book, Speaking, Speaking Our Minds, and the, it is a view on how two systems might interact. And he's talking really about humans, but how two systems might interact, not through a process of passing bits on wires, but through a process of extension and inference, where you have two agents that are interacting and one agent might be trying to, in fact, affect change in the models within that other agent. And so they make something visible. They're not trying to encode things on a channel. I always thought about interaction between systems in terms of the bits on the wires and the coding. But really, I think what's changed my thinking in, in a fairly substantive way, and I, I do think it's really transforming the way I'm approaching a lot of the problems that I, that I, that I study these days, is the idea that one system might be, in fact, putting out something into the world, some actions in the world, with the, with the intention of changing the model of another agent so that that, mod, that agent will in fact change its model of the first agent. So this isn't putting bits on wires. This is actually a process of, again, extension and inference. And I think this is really transformative. For those who know my work already, uh, most of what I look at is human machine interaction, especially tightly coupled interactions, like a person with a robotic arm that is attached directly to their nervous system. And so this idea of extension inference and how that might be, how that might relate to reinforcement learning problems in that setting is something that's, I think, uh, this beautiful blue sky area of, of study that I'm excited just to, to jump into. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Um, jumping to questions on chat uh, from Eric. Do you think the MDP framework is the right formalism for AI? He has some other follow-up questions to that, but maybe I'll just leave it leave it framed that way. Does anyone want to take a crack at this? Well, yes and no. I'll take a I mean, I'll take a I'll take a crack. And the answer is yes and no. The answer is uh, yes because it's exactly the way right way to imagine the world is. But it's no if you take it seriously and think you know what the states are of the world. And 
Yeah, it's just a formalism. It's not a. It's not something that you should think you have access to. Maybe in addition to this question is asking, um, well, I'm not sure what did I just think this question was asking. <laughs> we could also go to Eric and find out what this question was asking. In case you want to, you want to jump in Eric. I guess, I guess I'll say what I was going to say. I remembered what I wanted to say is that a lot of our real world problems have some kind of restrictions on the dynamics or other things that we could exploit to improve learning. And the MPP formalism is very general. So maybe there's a, there's a question here that says, should we be in our paper saying, I'm restricting myself to this class of MDPs? Might have been part of this question. Well, I think generality is an essential part of the power uh, of reinforcement learning. And I'm really loath to give it up. I'm loath to say, oh, let's do this special case and that special case. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, generality is, is our power. Maybe it's our superpower of reinforcement learning. I'm going to say one thing I don't like about the MDP formalism. Um, I do like its generality, actually. But we often have this ongoing debate about episodic settings and continuing settings. Uh, and maybe neither of those are either really what we want. The continuing setting is sort of, we're gonna interact with the world forever onward and often talk about average reward. And the episodic setting is, you know, we keep getting reset and restarted, which is also seemingly sort of unrealistic. I think when we, whenever we have this discussion, usually we actually care about the one life ends at some point setting. I don't want to call it the finite horizon setting because that still usually means episodic. Um, but I do think there's space to think about how can we change the formalism so we're just asking how well can an agent do if it gets to interact with the world for approximately, you know, a large number of H steps. That's maybe itself probabilistic. Now, I think the online learning people already do this. Like they already ask, what is my regret after some number of steps? And they're not asked, they're not doing repeated episodes, but we don't seem to do that when we're doing RL. Maybe Chabba would want to comment on that. You're right. <laughs> Eric, I'm, I'm gonna invite you if you wanted to unmute and, and drill the panelists harder if you felt like they didn't answer your question. In the meanwhile, uh, related to that, I would say is the framework, the, the interaction model that it provides Right, so which is that an agent and environment interacts with it. Uh, one thing that is uh, easy to miss here is that it defines an interface a boundary. And our goal here is that the agent has to do everything through this interface, right? So, and that's kind of also also uh, true for uh, animals. Everything we do in a lifetime, we do it through our sensory motor boundary. Uh, and that has been a focus uh, at the core of our research that we try not to uh, help agent by other means than by giving the initial uh, algorithm and then defining a boundary and let it actually take care of its life. And I, th I think that's, that's a powerful thing, that formally. So I'm writing a paper now where I want to celebrate this, this interface because I think it's so good. <laughs> and, uh, and like Rohan is asking about the POMDP case. So POMDP is a partially observable MDP. So it's still an MDP, okay? POMDP is an MDP. We love MDPs, we love interaction. Uh, we don't want to assume that, that we observe the state, of course. It's really good. I think we should love it. The MDP framework. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna... oh, sorry. Go ahead, Martha. I was saying no, that's ahead. Roland's question about having the same question for POM DPs is that it is also the right formalism in the sense that we're just adding out this additional observation function. There's still an underlying MDP. So also, also positive. Uh, 
Uh, great. I'm, I'm going to switch us gears a little bit and go to uh, this anonymous question here of how important is it to work on problems that are aligned with what we see in nature? And I'm going to throw this over to Patrick. Maybe Patrick is throwing it back. <laughs> Did we lose you, Patrick? Oh yeah, totally. I, I my network totally jammed up, and I had to go into a hard line, so it's still really choppy for me for some reason. I'm sorry. I'm back though. Okay. Do you, okay. So the question: uh, Should we? Uh, how important is it to work on problems that are aligned with what we see in nature? That was what I was going to throw to you. Huh. Aligned with, did the, sorry, when I was, when I was offline, did someone present what they mean by aligned with nature? Did the, did the question asker actually say that? Or should I just like make up what it's I think a, it, what that means? It's an anonymous question. So I think, I think you can, okay. you can interpret okay, cool. it as. So, my, so I could imagine two different things that might be being asked, and I, I'm going to try to answer maybe both of them quickly. Uh, one thing I could imagine would be to to say that well, we can o we can only try to solve problems that we see directly presented to us in nature. One of them might be directly replicating animal intelligence. This is something that that usually I hear mentioned is like, well, okay, let's try to build machines which are able to directly replicate exactly what's going on in some organism like C. elegans or something else um, or right up through dogs and cats and humans. Um, and so directly replicating on all of the different levels, if we like take Mars levels, directly replicating something that's happening in nature, I'm not sure is, I, I, I think that that's a trap and I can see it being a trap. I, I know there's certain research communities which are trying to do a very good job of with high fidelity replicating exactly what's happening in nature in a synthetic form. This is a lot of the, the work on, on building neural networks, which are actually look exactly like a neural network. So I think that aligning in that sense is maybe um, is interesting. There's good research that comes out of it. But I think that that perhaps uh, maybe this is exactly how Joseph Modell would say it is that that being motivated by phenomena in nature is in fact a very powerful thing. And so if I if I think about aligning to problems that we see in nature, either like the, the kinds of problems like naturalistic problems or naturalistic uh, challenges, like replicating a thinking machine. But I do think that we we can be motivated and inspired by those ideas. I think those ideas can can drive forward what we do. And that alignment's really important, both aligning to the, the suchness of the problem and the such the suchness of perhaps the system that we are trying to affect deconstruct or understand. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Does anyone else want to make a comment on that question? I can say a few words. So uh, it's especially important when we want to try to uh, explain something in nature. For example, again, uh, uh, I kind of alluded it in my last response, which is that uh, in our formalism, we have this interface, which is kind of similar to the interface of animals. And this is especially important if we are trying to explain animal intelligence. If we have that ambition, then we would actually like to be aligned with what we see in nature in that sense. And, some, and sometimes also, uh, I would say that, especially for intelligence, that's the the only evidence we have sometimes that can be uh, uh, helpful to think that if, if nature arrived at it uh, and and I'm kind of looking for an idea how to do intelligence maybe that's a good way to uh, make advancement that nature solved it this way uh, maybe I should use this idea and see if that works We just take Feel a moment like... to, to reiterate the, uh, the the most important distinction, which is between problems and solution methods. You know, this question is as written is asking about the problem. Should the problem be aligned with the problem that we see in nature, or, and that can be separated from the question whether our solution methods should be aligned with the solutions that we see in nature. And I just think it is. I think it is really important that the problem the problem is aligned with nature. Um, 
important. I mean, problems are always a choice, uh, but but it's it's cool uh, to take the problems as nature. As what are we trying to do? We're trying to reproduce the abilities we see in animals and natural intelligence systems. It is pretty much the definition of the problem. So I think there's a strong a strong pull of of the kind of intelligence we see in nature. Well, thanks, Rich. Um, I feel like there's this robust discussion on chat around MDPs again. So I, I want to return back to that. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to Chaba. Chaba, do you want to you want to summarize uh, some of what's been happening on chat and, and and or turn it into a question, and then we can let some of the panelists respond. Yeah, I guess a while ago I was asking whether uh, the fact that we are or MDPs are stochastic is important or not. And then we kind of got reeled into like, okay, uh, but like there are these states and they are hidden, so why do they even matter? matter? Uh, and then to that, I was conjecturing that somehow that gives you some regularity. So I've always been thinking about that as a hint that the words may seem to be large because you have all these observations, but many of those things lead to the same thing. So there is some underlying hidden structure and then the question is, can we take advantage of that? So, so where are the algorithms that maybe that's a question? Uh, are we working on the right thing? Shouldn't be working on the algorithms that try to take advantage of this and, and how are we going to do it? I know that we are trying to construct the state and all that. Uh, maybe the question is, how far are we of, of really doing this? Uh, is there anything like that's in the back burner uh, being prepared that we should pay more attention to. Chaba, would you say that uh, the predictive state representation work was, was aiming in that direction to try to think about state construction as explicitly you know, discovering core tests and in some ways tying that to the, yeah. you know, the underlying rank of. Absolutely. Okay. So taking taking this problem more seriously and, and putting more effort into this, uh, I think that that would be really wonderful. I know that here a lot of people are thinking about this a lot. <laughs> Does any of our panelists want to jump in? I'm not really sure what to say about it, other than the fact that maybe we're already exploiting this structure by assuming we can even do state construction in the first place, and a lot of us are assuming we can. But maybe that's not, maybe you're imagining that we should be much more explicitly assuming something and actually trying to say identify that small latent state. Yeah, so how, uh, the question is whether we have enough signal that would drive our algorithms into the right direction so blind search eventually is gonna get everything, but you don't want to do it. Like you, you want something more intelligent than that. And so what is that signal? So I, I feel that I'm often stuck at that question. <laughs> so I wonder whether someone has some strong feel about that some direction is, is really promising and then we should put more effort into that direction. I'll maybe comment to say that I like we have done like in terms of finding finding good state, we put a ton of effort in ourselves through this over the years. I think all of us will have looked at like when we're dealing with something that we are hoping that like things that love MDPs will love this. OK, great. How do we make this into something more MDP like we build in histories? We try to figure out which sensors to take keep traces of a lot of the robotics work. I know that we've done over a very long time. We've done state construction ourselves whether it's predictive straight con constructing per predictive states or whether it's constructing states that just accumulate different facets of the environment to make it into something that feels like an MPP. We've done a lot of that by hand. So I think that the, just as an observation, looking at back at the work over like say even the last decade, uh, let's call that recent, then yeah, there's been a lot of hand state construction to try to make things sort of fit into the MDP shaped uh, sort of template, even though maybe that isn't, that doesn't feel quite natural to the, to the problems. Right, I guess I'm looking for something a little bit more automated or general as Rich, following Rich's program of, of trying to keep things general. Also Me one, too, Chad, me too. 
one regularity that I've been kind of thinking about, since you use the word regularity, some property of the MVPs that I think we'll, we will have is that the observations that we see are, there's going to be lots of interesting things to predict. And so one of the ways we can actually explore our space would be to have our agents try to learn how to predict many things. So they would actively go seek more data so they can make better predictions rather than say trying to find, you know, improve the reward. That I think that is one way we should be doing exploration is leveraging the fact that there's probably lots of useful things to predict. And then hopefully that course pushes you to go and further explore out. It's a bold, it's a, it's a bold claim to assume that that is a property your MVP has, but you ask what is one thing someone's pursuing? I, I think that's a good direction. So um, let me talk some more about the problem and the solution methods. I think MDPs are great for the problem, but not at all for solution methods. We should not mm -hmm. think about the states of the... And so just to irritate perhaps Chaba, even though <laughs> I know Chaba is such a nice guy, I can't be irritated. I will say that, that any bound with the number of states in, in it is, 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 is meaningless and pointless because the number of states is, is gigantic and you can't get can linear in it. How about the lower bonds? No, no bounds. There's a number of states no in it. At all. But that just says the same thing as what you say. <laughs> 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 that just reinforces that. Yeah. Right? They're, 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 they're true, but they're, I don't know, shall I say useless? They're meaningless. They can help us because they're, they, this number of states is so large. Um, so, you know, we, sh we should keep this, we have to keep this separate. Solution methods and problems are separate, you know. Just because MDP is great for the problem doesn't mean it's great for the solution methods. And so, so stop confusing that in your mind. Stop it. <laughs> your solutions shouldn't say, oh, I'm going to assume the world has some structure and it's simple. No, no, no. You are your solution method will be simple and it will, it will only work if there are certain structures that are available to be found. Okay, but that's, that's on you. The world is immensely complex and it, it's, it's not been set up for you and are structured in any way to be appropriate for you. Uh, you are, are making sense of little bits of it as you can. That's all there, you know, that's the end of the story. So, so you're facing this, this mess. Does it help you to think about it as discrete states with transition probabilities? No, it doesn't help you at all. Okay, so, so, so stop thinking that way. You have to deal with the complexity of the world. And the world is much more complex than you will ever understand. So you, you will, you will you'll just uh, understand a piece of it. A tiny piece of it. That's the way it should be, and we should be honored to be to be encountering this world and just having the opportunity to to, to figure out a piece of it. It's great. So, uh, Rich, in MDP formulation, we have these Markov states. These are not observable. So, how do how does it help to use it to formulate the problem? Not very much. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so stop stop trying. <laughs> You have to make the state. Like we, we, have, we have a group, uh, about 10 people. Like we talk about the agent state and stuff every week. Uh, it's, it's really important. And dynamic networks, dynamic learning networks, they would be what their first use should be for uh, constructing a state. Now, I think you can study it in the IED setting, and that's probably the right way to begin. You should always have an idea to the use. The use will be to construct the state. Very important. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, early on, uh, in Rich's uh, introductory answer gave um, gave the statement no replay buffers. Uh, there was a question earlier in chat that responded, uh, and I'm paraphrasing this. I'm not gonna go back and, and I'll paraphrase it in my my words, which is I mean often the replay buffers in reinforcement learning are very much around trying to create make the problem the certain learning aspect of the problem look IID to the learner uh, because our methods depend on that. Are we doing enough research in the non-IID setting? And uh, is the field doing enough research in the non-IID setting uh, that we could start getting rid of re replay buffers? I know there are examples where it's actually been done, but um, are we doing enough just in the non-IID setting? I mean, I guess if we wanted to move towards not using replay buffers and not having ID data, then no, not really. Most people are using replay buffers and dealing with IID data. 
So I guess no. But I, I'm, I'm going to question the first thing you said that we use replay to have IID data. I like to think of replay as an ability to reuse data because our algorithms are um, slow and optimization. And so it's just sort of an optimization tool rather than mechanism to make the data IID. So when we throw away replay, we're throwing away, multiple, we're throwing away <laughs> multiple things when we throw away replay. I also think of replay a little bit like Dinah, to be honest, and I kind of like Dinah. Yeah, the thing about replay buffers is they are, they're exactly what I'm trying to talk about when I say we have narrowed our, our scope too much. Uh, everyone use the, uses them because the methods they use don't work well without them. And so then everyone does it, so everyone studies that. And you know, yeah, some of us maybe should continue with that, but, but what we should get beyond that. So, so that's what I say, deliberate effort. Let's, let's just not do that. Let's see what you can do without that. Uh, I'd like to say a little bit more, which is that it is, you know, what's the choice? The choice really facing the machine uh, is it, it's, um, should it replay old stuff? Or should it look more carefully, more fully at the at the new stuff? So it's a, there's always a trade-off. It's a limited machine. If you if you want to look more fully at the at the at the at the new stuff, and then you got to put it in a replay buffer, it just gets way too expensive. Or if you have to stop looking at the, this stuff and look at look at the old stuff, you know it's a trade-off. It's not free. There's nothing free. And people say, oh, why should you throw it away? Well, why should you ignore the current information. The current data is, is really pertinent. Well, maybe that's more of an argument against how we currently use replay. Maybe, maybe the following is possible. You maximally use your new data, and now you just have a few extra cycles before you have to take your next action. So you go and you check out something that happened five days ago, and you do a bit of updating, and then you know, so on. Well, so I really think you, we should fight against that. That, that line of thought, like to remember the data, like to remember all the photons entering your eye, like you do enormous processing on in the retina that never gets past the optic nerve. Okay, and which are you going to remember? You're going to remember everything entering the eye, or you're going to remember it after the optic nerve? Um, it's it, it really is an enormous demand on your machine to say you should remember every sensation that entered your interface. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the biggest limitation of replay, that the way that it is literally is you replay exactly the data point that you saw. And then if we start moving to, well, maybe we should replay some new representation of the thing that we saw. Well, then now it's not really replay anymore. Now that's starting to look a little bit more like model-based stuff. So in that sense, I agree. Yeah. I, I like that. And Martha, that's, that was, I was going to chime in the same way is in, in that, I mean, Rich, you were saying that the replay buffer would be a, essentially capturing the, the raw sensory motor stream. There's no reason why we couldn't keep a buffer of other things, latent spaces, all these other things as well. And that gets back to Mike. I think some of the things I remember from conversations with you and, and Anna Coop is that replay buffers also provide us something nice in the form of history and context. That should be helpful. Like if we don't think about it, like I'm going to be passing back samples that I've already seen and trying to use it, use it for the some of the like storing my samples route. But instead we say, this is a maybe a nice, Maybe there are there's utility to replay buffers in that they do provide some kind of sense of context, especially if you, if you in some way prioritize those replay buffers or keep around things that were especially salient. And then, yeah, maybe there's a better use for them in terms of providing context to a learning machine as opposed to simply just squeezing the most out of the samples that you've seen. I, I, I like the contextual argument. I think that might be nice. And it doesn't necessarily need to be grounded in just the raw sensory motor experience. You could then keep weight keep your contextual buffers of, of any parts of the internal machinery of the machine. There's some really good questions on chat that we're not going to get to. I'm going to end with one question that I want to hear from all of the panelists on. Uh, and this is the question, what does the future of AI look like for all of you? Uh, is it more like AGI, a human-like agent that does many things OK? Or is it more like superhuman performance on narrow tasks that help humanity? But then I, I really want to focus on the, the last part of this question. How does RL fit into your vision of the future? Uh, but everyone's only going to get like a minute. So Rupam, you're first. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I like the question. And, and I'll probably address the first part, which is that I think it's going to be both. Uh, we'd like to have both superhuman performance, but not necessarily an animal-like agent. And as well as we, we would like uh, uh, animal-like 
agents uh, that are capable uh, to autonomously move around, especially because uh, they are quite robust and we, we, we are robust as people. We, are, we don't have enough of us. The universe is vast, is big. And if you think about that, we, we don't have enough of us. We need a lot of AI agents that are just like animals, but on a different substrate and then can explore the universe the way we, we would want to do that. So that's my vision and I, yeah. Oh, how does it fit? It fits very well. RL is the, the, the only framework at this point I can see that I, I, I can use. But we definitely need more more uh, extension of, of that, such as the question about MDP, what framework uh, really is close to the solution. Okay. Thanks, Rupam. Martha. I really like that answer. We need to make, put ourselves on a different substrate, essentially, so that that new creature can go and explore the universe. I've never heard that one before. Uh, I'm I'm more of a practical person, I actually care less about AGI. I'm not sure what the ramifications of creating something that is very similar to us. I understand why others are interested in that. I'm interested more just understanding learning algorithms so that we can solve real problems. So for me, the future of AI just looks like smarter automated systems and hopefully that's gonna happen soon. And I think reinforced learning is gonna be a part of that solution. So I guess when it comes to, is it gonna look more human-like or is it gonna be very narrow? I think if we wanna have you know, adaptive automated systems, they have to be general purpose to some extent. They're not gonna be very specialized engineered systems. Well, Do you have an answer to the role of RL, Martha? I think it will be integral. <laughs> Fair enough. Rich, I was gonna have you go last, but you're about to jump in, why don't you go? <laughs> yeah, and I don't have a, a profound answer. I just want to mention the one that that, that that hasn't been mentioned is probably maybe maybe the most important, which would be uh, the they will be a, they will be helpful to us. They will be assistance, and they will be you know memory and cognitive and and detail work assistance of all kinds. I think you just stole Patrick's answer. Uh, <laughs> oh no! My, oh no! My my, my. <laughs> Rich didn't steal my answer. I think my answer is maybe maybe more bold than Rich's answer. Rich, are you done? You want me to you want me to fire off? Okay. I mean, the, the answer I've given before, and some of you heard me give this answer, is that in fact, superhuman intelligence, the first superhuman intelligence is already us. It will be us. It will continue to be us. We continue to extend and incorporate tools into ourselves, even thinking tools. We incorporate each other into each other. That was part of how I even opened this. And so that my my view is that the way this will play out is that we continue to change and we continue to continue to inc increase the envelope of our capacity in terms of our ability to act upon the world to perceive the world and think about the world um so the strong agi will be us it is already us it'll probably continue to be us and that's a very normal thing and it's very natural it's been happening since we started using tools a long time ago and even animals do it so it's cool uh, let's not freak out about it. And then how is RL important to it? The, the process of trial and error is the only process by which, or let me, no, I think, I, I think I'll be strong about this and say that I believe a process of trial and error is the only way by which the, we might see that slow, gradual amplification process unfold. And that is how it has unfolded. And that's how we should expect it to unfold. So RL is intimately connected to this pursuit. And we should work very hard to study and understand how that trial and error process actually informs our incorporation of thinking machines into our own thinking substrate. So I think it's stronger than what you said, Rich, and maybe a little bit more bold um, in that uh, it's not even assistance, it's that it's us. Okay, I expected everyone to actually take us over time answering that question. So I'm going to jump to them one more that maybe you can give a quick answer to. Do we actually wait long enough? Uh, or how long should we expect our agents to actually learn? Are we giving our agents enough time to learn? Or are we so demanding that our experiments must respond in our grad nope. student cycle such that we don't give a chance for our agents to actually learn what they should? We're not waiting nearly long enough. We are super lazy and expect results way too fast. If our experiments aren't lasting literally years or decades, we're just doing it wrong. We expect things to happen on GPU clusters in minutes or hours or even overnight, and that's bonkers. We should expect that like real experiments to study learning are gonna take a very long time, maybe years or decades. And so no, we're not nearly waiting long enough. I'm gonna say this is a call to action. We've been always talking about in my group about hitting run on a on an agent that learns for like several months and sort of log what it's doing, but let it keep running for a very long time. 
We even have a Slack channel called RLAI Nursery, which has no nothing in it. But I think this would be amazing if we had this. You can have like a collection of agents. They all get started at different times. They keep running. You can always start a new one. Let the other one keep running. That having been said, uh, it's also sad that most of our agents will not continue to learn very much. Uh, and that's what I'm calling for by asking for dynamic learning networks. Networks to continue to learn and continue to learn how to learn better as they go along. So it's it's a it's a meta or multi-phase learning process. And we're only going to figure out such algorithms if we do as Mike says or suggests, which means we have we wait long enough for their for their advantages to show up. And and I did a calculation once uh, if you're having samples at a rate of like say 10 millisecond during a PhD, uh, you're gonna have samples in the order of billion, <laughs> billion samples. So I, I think, yeah, that's a good, good time scale where we can do great things. Couple of PhDs, AGI will be very close. The problem is we need, the problem is we need 30 seeds. Just kidding, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> all right. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. We've crossed five o'clock. Thank you to all of the audience who've offered questions. I'm sorry if you asked a question, I didn't get it to ask it. If you're still feeling like it's a burning question, I think toss it up in the RLAI channel. Panelists or anyone else can feel free to, to, to uh, offer thoughts on it. So uh, we don't have to stop asking questions here. Uh, but thanks again to the panelists and thank you all for joining. Hope you all have a great evening.